And we are live right now. Welcome to our first uh, event series, the Burnout Talks. I would like to welcome our guests as well here in the studio and uh, those who are joining us online. Uh, okay, so I would like to start with a uh, few words about Vigiburn and uh, why we started it, um, what was our intent behind it, and uh, where do we want to progress it or see it progresses. Uh, actually, it started in 2019 uh, when we saw a statistic um, which was uh, uh, really shocking actually for us that we, we've seen a spike in burnout cases uh, in the recent years, uh, the last three or four years actually. Uh, and we really caught our interest and uh, decided to, to see what can we do about it. Or, and uh, because we are professionals within the life science field, uh, we also um, started thinking how can we uh, uh, maybe approach it in a different way. Uh, and also it was not just a statistic for us, especially for me as well, because I went to burnout two times in, uh, <laughs> in my career as well. Um, and we uh, started to, to think of ways, how can we contribute, how can we counter this trend of rising cases, uh, and uh, really uh, to, to raise awareness around this topic. And um, that's why we decided to um, establish DigiBurn as a digital platform uh, for uh, mainly uh, diagnostics, but also prevention uh, or prevent preventive techniques. Um, and hopefully uh, in his uh, later stages of development, a tool which can uh, serve as a recovery uh, platform in order to uh, help those who are undergoing burnout or at the early stages of it. Uh, and maybe to uh, try to reverse that trend or at least be a part of the solution rather than the problem. Uh, so with that being said, uh, this is the, the, the uh, intent behind this video series, uh, mainly to raise awareness on the topic and also, as we mentioned in the description, uh, to really approach it more holistically, to, to see it from different points of view, to uh, discuss it more in depth and not only talk about the problem or um, analyze the problem, but also give enough time to, or sufficient time to solution strategies or different coping uh, uh, mechanisms and ways we can <clears throat> uh, use or even prevention techniques that are uh, proven and tested throughout experience um, and uh, also recognized uh, as a way to, to counter this. So, with that being said, I would like to uh, introduce our guests and uh, uh, without further ado, move towards them uh, uh, to giving them the floor to uh, present themselves, starting with the ones that are currently uh, offline <laughs> and live here with us, and then move uh, to our online speakers um, uh, towards. So, uh, uh, Alina, I would like to start with you, maybe a few words about you and uh, also your experience or experience or encounter with the burnout. Welcome, first of all. And thank you for the invitation as well. I'm actually here in, in my two roles, just like yourself. Uh, maybe from one point of view, I'm going to provide an expert's uh, perspective as well, mm -hmm. working with clients, but I also find the topic very dear to myself because I have been through my own experience with burnout a couple of years ago. So I think this is where we can all relate here tonight. Um, also, what I've seen, especially through my experience in the IT sector, this is where I have been working most of the time in the last couple of years, is um, the tendency to really uh, identify ourselves with work. So that's yeah. why I have this risk now to start to present myself to my professional role. But I do believe we are all much more than that. Mm. If you want me to give me, if you want me to give the titles, of course, I uh, do work as a psychologist, as a body psychotherapist, but mostly focused on the um, in the workplace and working with people to encourage them to speak about their mental health in a more proactive way uh, without waiting for the problems really to become critical. But create space for people to feel a bit more comfortable discussing the topic, reaching out to an expert if they really need to, and um, even speaking to friends or sharing their stories, which can be very powerful. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll, uh, later on, we'll be discussing uh, the psychological and therapeutic uh, side of the of the problem as well. Okay, moving on to Jitko. Uh, welcome, first of all. Uh, thank you, and uh, very, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I always struggle when I have to introduce myself because I usually wear uh, many hats. 
uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would say, I, I would put it like that, uh, my part uh, is the part of a uh, uh, financial professional who uh, happened to be healthcare. And uh, this is what I'm doing uh, basically almost uh, all of my professional life until now. I have moved to uh, a very interesting and challenging uh, corporate career. And uh, after that, I have made myself independent and together with a group of partners, uh, we are developing uh, uh, a number of initiatives in the field of life sciences and healthcare. And uh, I myself uh, haven't had the burnout out yet. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Uh, but uh, on a personal level, we have suffered severely from uh, burnout of people that are very close to me, including uh, uh, losing one of the projects that I, I loved uh, really much and I have invested a lot of uh, uh, compassion, work, time, and, uh, and of course, money. Uh, due to due to the burnout of a very dear friend of mine, uh, and uh, that's why the topic is uh, is very close to my uh, to my heart. And uh, actually, I'm I'm seeing a lot of a uh, lot of uh, uh, people, beautiful people with great talent, uh, actually not uh, able to unleash their potential because of uh, uh, conditions uh, uh, or after burnout. Hmm. Thank you. Um, which if we're going to be discussing more of the financial side um, of, of this and also the uh, the financial cost that uh, burnout uh, can uh, be of an org for an organization or uh, whether it be in a startup or developed one, uh, but uh, that will come uh, soon. Ivo, moving on to yeah. you, welcome uh, and thanks for being our guest tonight. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. So uh, a few words about yourself. Um, uh, in terms of uh, your professional role or professional identity? <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, as all of us, we have so many different roles, but uh, from my point of view, I'm first of all burnout survivor or two-time burnout survivor. A champion. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm a champion, but uh, <laughs> people that experience the problems that we have to discuss right now. And because it's really important uh, burnout stays be below the radar uh, mm. for a lot of people a lot of professionals and they think that this is something that it's usual that it has to be like that mm. but let's say this is not the the way Definitely. the people and uh, the situation has to be so let me introduce myself i'm a business and productivity consultant and trainer coach or call it how you want but i speak i work with uh, maybe the biggest bulgarian corporation and the uh, c-level managers of this corporation uh, how to be more productive how to be better managers leaders and stuff like that my name is lino i i my background is in uh, software engineering originally and then over the last 10 or so years i've been running several different companies and startups and i've also worked with a lot of entrepreneurs in different acceleration support programs and most recently we're working on raising a fund so uh, on the topic of uh, mental fitness during entrepreneurship I, I have quite a bit of experience including going through some pretty tough uh, times myself and i'd love to share some of these um, stories and try to offer whatever wisdom has built up uh, as, as, as much as i can as, as long as i can get in in touch with the rest of the group somehow and what I'm thinking is because it's so streamed on Clubhouse, maybe I can just connect to the Clubhouse and, and hear what's happening from there, but speak through. I mean, you know, it's just a sophisticated uh, technical yeah. solution. Oh, that's not entirely true, you know. now, now I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now you see, so it was because of me. <laughs> Great. Uh, just before we move on to Elena, thank you, Lino. Uh, a few words about the Q&A session, finally, <laughs> is going to be at the end. If you have any questions uh, for us, both here in the studio and also uh, the ones who are online, uh, you can type it in the, in the chat as well or send it to us. And now moving on to Elena. Elena, welcome and thank you for being our guest. Thank you for having me on this round table. 
Um, I'm really um, interested, um, actually, having a vest of personal interest to be here. And hello also to the online audience, because I see quite some people joined. And thank you guys for giving us heads up if you are hearing us or not. Um, as briefly introduced, um, I will be uh, taking the perspective or sharing the perspective of an HR professional uh, and how, from an HR point of view, we managed through and lived through through the past year, uh, which was, um, oh dear, uh, so <laughs> unexpected and um, really um, taking its own way, so to say. Um, as a professional, uh, actually, uh, compared to other panelists, uh, I've been pretty consistent throughout my career. And um, I'm already a little bit over 10 years uh, in the HR profession, going through different um, roles. And um, mostly staying, though, in the ICT uh, sector. So um, what? Um, I actually would like to share today um, is how we as an organization um, at Bosch um, lived, uh, lived the, the year uh, in a way um, that's uh, in a way that we stayed uh, really um, close and at the eye level uh, with uh, our colleagues. That was the most challenging, really, uh, thing for not only for us as an HR uh, function, uh, but also um, overall as the management of, of organizations. So I'm also really looking forward to the insights uh, from the um, other panelists and uh, also things that I could take for myself as uh, is a, on a personal level because I believe uh, we face the uh, different challenges as professionals, but also at a personal level, uh, and how we can um, actually adopt it, as you said, uh, Georgi, very practically um, in our everyday life, so that we can actually more work towards being self-aware and also prevent things before already being too late. the HR role in the organization. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll be discussing more the HR role within the organization uh, late, uh, later tonight. So uh, I would like to start the panel discussion now, uh, actually, when we talked about it in the um, initial chat that we have with, with uh, all the guests. Uh, we encountered a question which was really interesting and uh, I believe important for everyone who's watching as well. Uh, and I would like to start with Belina, with you. Uh, what is burnout actually from a psychological, or maybe more of a psychotherapeutic point of view? Shall we start with the serious part so then we can discuss the, uh, maybe the rest of the personal stories. Mm -hmm. um, if we look, if we look at the way we consider and the way we refer to burnout, it seems that everyone has had some experience. And I usually tend to hear some of my patients saying, oh, I'm a little bit burned out these days, or feeling a bit of stress. And it feels like this is so common that we mm -hmm. regard it as an everyday condition, as you just you brush your teeth and you feel a little bit burned out. So <laughs> <laughs> I want to put it out on the table that if we're starting already to feel some signs of chronic stress, exhaustion, even if we have a sense that we are uh, getting to the point of mental and physical exhaustion, um, the jokes, putting the jokes beside, uh, it's time to look into ourselves and really get, um, get some space to feel where we are right now in our career, how much our spirit putting, how is our mental, physical, emotional health. And if we feel that we are at risk, uh, it will be best to speak to a professional. We don't go to your GP, that's usually the first step that people take. But burnout in itself is not something that we feel on an everyday basis. So that's why I'm starting with that. Um, unfortunately, it is already a medical condition mm -hmm. that a lot of people are getting diagnosed with, just like we get diagnosed with depression, with the flu, with the, um, other diseases, 
and uh, it's a very serious condition that we shouldn't um, we shouldn't underestimate in a sense. Um, and it's real like final stage where we can really feel that we are mentally and physically burned out. The syndrome looks like depression, and it's all in the full clinical picture. It's uh, very similar to the sense of. Uh, inner emptiness where mm. people can't really relate to their jobs anymore not only with their jobs you feel completely detached from everything else in your life um this is the point where you feel most probably those of you guys who experienced it know that um you're putting in the effort but you're not achieving anything there. mm. there's very little productivity at the end um you also don't have a lot of desire to meet with friends with colleagues so a lot of your values have changed in a way that uh, it feels that nothing else really matters anymore. And uh, at that point, you can really see a lot of physical symptoms. We can talk mm. a little bit more about the symptoms, but yeah. um, it's, it's affecting our minds, our emotions, our behavior, and our physical health as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's why, because uh, maybe um, uh, it's, it will be beneficial to clarify why do we call it a syndrome. Uh, because it's a variety of symptoms. It's not just one symptom mm -hmm. um, that is, uh, it's not just a one symptom, it's, uh, it's a variety of symptoms that is, is, is related and causing the burnout syndrome. Uh, maybe yet we can talk about more about the, the, especially at the earlier stages, maybe I think it would be beneficial, but uh, how can people uh, detect that something is going on? Mm -hmm. well, there's great, there's interesting article I want to read about it. Uh, it's about the 12 stages of burnout, and there's very, very different assessments that we, we can all take actually right now and mm. home assess ourselves. Uh, but still, at the beginning, uh, we first see the signs uh, in our memory, in our capacity to concentrate, in our cognitive abilities. Mm. This is the first thing that, even uh, when um, if those of you are studying psychology and psychiatry, this is the first symptoms that we actually assessed in psychotic um, and mm. depressed patients as well. So, the moment we feel that our memory, our cognitive abilities are decreasing, we can't concentrate, uh, we're forgetting things, uh, we feel we're looking into the blank screen and we can't even type or we, we forget what we're about to do. This is already a sign that most probably you are already on the stress, on the stress cycle. Uh, what we also see at the very early stages is change of behavior and change of patterns of sleeping, eating. You occasionally start to drop some meat, uh, skip meals, um, people start to self-isolate. Before things get really critical, we start to drop our meetings with friends and family. So all those small changes in behavior is already signs that something is going on. On the physical level as well, uh, agitation, irritability, this is something that we all, again, underestimate. We feel, oh, it's okay just to get it angry. But if you notice yourself that you're having anxious thoughts a few times a week, every single week for a period of a month or so, it means that's not okay. Mm -hmm. So anxiety, uh, inability to switch off also, which also we regard as something normal, which is not. Um, and on a physical level, usually, we sometimes feel a little stress in our stomach, so any problems with our guts, mm -hmm. it could be a symptom of uh, chronic stress that hasn't been managed very well. Mm -hmm. And also, in terms of uh, earlier indicators, it's uh, way easier to address them at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, rather than wait to, uh, yeah. for them to uh, fully develop in, in, in the Full out burnout. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I really don't want to be dramatic here and mm -hmm. just wanted to see it as it is and mm -hmm. then uh, uh, to discuss ways to uh, to address it proactively. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what is the, uh, let's say, main factors that are contrib contributing to, to the syndrome or to development of the syndrome? Oh, that's a big one, yeah, especially <laughs> looking at the question from a COVID perspective. Uh, it's been hard already before the pandemic, and I think now it's even harder. I have an additional COVID question. Yes, uh, <laughs> and I thought about how we can, we can do a short I did a study about, as I told you, I focusing on mental health um, in the workplace in the last two years intensively, and I did a study um, survey around people in the IT sector in uh, 2020, so last year. Um, I was able to organize most of the factors that are, were affecting our mental health even before the crisis in three categories. So individual, our own beliefs, behaviors, and uh, biology, basically, our genes, but also social factors, so our upbringing, our family, the way we interact with our colleagues, and then the work factors, everything that is related to um, the work environment, our relationship with our manager, the way that the projects are organized, so mm -hmm. 
if I have to start maybe from the work setting, that's most concerning because burnout mostly it's only occurs in the setting of work. Uh, what causes a real issue is this uncertainty that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the time, people find themselves collaborating with colleagues. Oh, can't you? A little bit. Oh, uh, collaborating with colleagues uh, twenty four seven. So we all know this. Uh, this challenge of not being able to switch off. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, most of us actually find ourselves in a situation where um, we work in a very abstract environment. So we can't really put the natural end to our jobs the way it used to, to be before. So if we look at our uh, grandparents and parents, they used to work on the field and they were gardening and they were also looking after some animals, you know, mm -hmm. reading chicken and everything. You collect the eggs and you, can use, you make uh, some, something for dinner and you say, this is what I did. The, most of the jobs that we do today are very, the outcome of our jobs um, is very intangible. And by the end of the day, what are the people that I work with, they have a sense of unfulfillment. It's not enough. You're not enough. Uh, we rarely get recognition. Actually, the lack of recognition is at the core of burnout. Mm -hmm. You're putting in a lot of effort, a lot of your time, a lot of your mental and emotional energy, but when you don't get enough feedback, either from your manager, from clients, or even you can't personally assess what, what, did, what did you do today, um, this all feeds this feeling of inadequacy and not, not feeling enough and this drive to actually put in more and more and more. And we also know that um, uh, stress is addictive a little bit. Mm -hmm. The adrenaline rush that we have, it's very similar to the adrenaline rush we have when we're driving uh, with high speed. And for some people, it can really give them this temporary sense of importance, which is actually not sustainable in the long term. So the way that our jobs are designed most of the time are really... Uh, predisposition for, for mm. this and most of us don't actually have, have the skills to operate in that. Then when we have the uncertainty, the projects are changing very often, especially in the IT sector. I see some people working on a project, they put their whole heart and then, you know, Agile initially was designed to respond to customers' needs in a positive way, mm -hmm. but then your project changes and maybe something that, that you've dedicated long hours, it just becomes relevant within a month. And this uh, lack of purpose as well, change of purpose, it's really uh, detrimental, debilitating in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all factors that contribute to our predisposition at work. Of course, our relationship with our manager, we can't skip that, obviously. We're social animals, so if we are constantly experiencing conflict and issues at work, this is really affecting our emotional health. Uh, on the social, uh, social uh, economic perspective also our upbringing our family values the way we consider what, what is work for me for my mm -hmm. family what is expected what are the metrics of success in yeah. in, in today's world uh, there is a very interesting book i really love it by ariana huffington she speaks about the third metric of success of success which is much beyond money and positions and these are all factors that are creating a framework for us to chase something that not really sure this is what we really want in life. And on a personal level, of course, uh, the, each individual's personal beliefs and values, mm. because burnout at the first stages, uh, those of you who, who check out the article, the first stage is obsessive compulsion to prove yourself. And this comes from your belief system about yourself. And a sense of lack. And a sense of lack, so constantly needing external validation. That's why there's some people who actually put it in 12, or about 14 hours a day, and they don't end up being burned out. There are other people who work maybe a couple of hours a week or even part-time jobs and they feel burnout. out, that they reach, uh, they feel the physical symptoms because this internal um, conflict that's created be be between their, um, let's say, with your net worth as a human being and your added value as a <laughs> professional, as a parent and all of the other social roles, um, it's really defining who we really are. And that's very tricky. That's why usually when people come in and they want easy solutions, mm -hmm. uh, give me give me some ideas how to rest. It's not about resting mechanisms. We know how to rest. It's about your beliefs that you hold about yourself. Whoa. <laughs> okay, I didn't expect to go, <laughs> to go in that deep at the beginning, but uh, maybe just a few more words because I believe this is the part when most of the audience would, would relate to um, the situation from the past year, uh, <laughs> a little bit more than a year, uh, how does it reflect the, uh, the burnout conditions or the risk factors? So if you add to that, if we look, uh, I mean, generally we are all equipped to manage stress quite well, if it's short term and if it's, mm -hmm. um, in a sense, it's not much greater than our capacity to cope. 
when burnout can occur is, is when we have unmanaged chronic stress over time or when the challenges of the environment, the threat, are much greater than our resources to cope. So you can imagine an already overworked society and IT sector, because this is where most of my examples are coming mm -hmm. from. And then we get this uh, huge, uh, I would say, a world crisis, uh, which is affecting our health, our finances, our domestic life, and all of that. And if for some families and for some individuals, all of this have coincided at the same time that they have issues at work. They had to learn how to work remotely very fast because they didn't have the experience. Then there is a partner showing symptoms, you're um, afraid um, of the virus yourself. Then you have concerns about your parents, then you're homeschooling. And all of those challenges, at some point, they, could, they can become much greater than our capacity to actually Hope, first to assimilate, yes, in combination where they happen. And this is what most of us experienced at the beginning between maybe March last year and mm -hmm. summer. Um, and, 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 and it was a huge challenge for a lot of people just to um, organize their, their life in, in a new way. And I would say over time at the beginning, even there, there was some optimism. People were excited because usually when there is a huge crisis or stress, we're getting mobilized. This is also mm -hmm. how our bodies respond. We have the adrenaline, adrenaline adrenaline rush and you want to respond but what happened is that if we continue operating at this high level of energy then it started uh, to decrease and we start to you know, get tired a little bit and this is what i saw in most of the companies that i work with in the autumn so at the beginning everyone was reading articles about activity from home putting boundaries having a schedule putting in your workloads even not working from your pajamas all of those things in September, October, November, it, uh, we already had enough of it. And it feels that um, those of us who are operating in the situation and like in a sprint, we exhausted more of our energy. And this is where everybody, uh, most of the people that work with had issues because we were not prepared to, uh, to approach the situation as a marathon. We just thought it's going to be for a month or, or a few. We mobilized most of our resources and then we, we felt unprepared to go like this for a year, even more. We don't know when it's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really, uh, really important and really to the point um, here. But uh, I would like to shift the focus a little bit now um, on, um, on maybe a few coping strategies or general principles. Uh, as we said earlier, we want to be pragmatic and practical. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for the people watching, how can uh, they uh, uh, not so much take advantage of the situation, but how can they manage or uh, address uh, the earlier symptoms? Um, okay, so first, if you are, if you see yourself that you are going in that cycle, you observe in yourself this high achievement attitude, you're putting in the extra hours, you're finding it hard to switch off and all of that. A very important question to start is to define what work is for you mm -hmm. and where it is in your priorities. If you're not, if you're in the final stages, there is a different approach. Uh, but if you're getting a sense that you're lost in why you where are you now in your career how are you feeling a very good question to start what is work for you what, what are your who are you outside of work what are other things that are important right now and that's an interesting question to ask especially as we most most of us work from home so we live in the same space where we parent where we eat where we sleep so it can become a bit tricky mm -hmm. people lose a sense of oh my god so who am I really? Am I just this person in front of the laptop? So uh, it's a time for this inner work, I would say, an existential question that we can all um, ask ourselves. And then obviously, the thing that I mentioned at the beginning, we need to accept the reality that we operate in a very abstract environment and we need to accept the fact that work doesn't end, especially for most of us professionals working in this complex job where we operate with other people we need to make strategies we need to solve problems work doesn't end and it's mm. up to us to define the end of our um, workflow of our day it's not going to come from the outside and i think this is this is the key for most people because we are waiting for the next project the next release to rest then we're gonna uh reach 50k a month and then we're gonna rest then i'm gonna do this project and then and then it just doesn't end and it's this realization if you can start putting some boundaries for yourself defining what an end looks like 
introducing some shutdown routines. I found this very helpful. Shutdown Especially, routines. Especially, yes, this is a ritual. You can have a start of the day ritual where you start your day with a very clear understanding of where you want to be by the end of the day. I'm sure the colleague here can share some ideas. But also the shutting down routine, very important. When you finish your day and how. And this is where it's very easy to introduce some kind of a physical activity. Mm. Like if you're heading with bed or you have to walk your dog, this is going to be a great way to finish your day. Uh, if you're working from home and from your living room and there's all sticky notes and laptop, everything is open, just physically making the act of closing your laptop, putting down your to-do list for the next day, having some ritual that actually wires your brain for a finito, this is very powerful. Mm. But definitely something engaging your body, even a workout. Those people who are working out, it's great to do it after work, so maybe the plan just to separate your work persona from your personal persona. A nice shower, taking a warm walk, having some time with friends. Nice really? cold shower. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely, yes. Everything that can help us to really engage our bodies and get out of our heads. Meditation and mindfulness as well. Uh, there were tons of opportunities. It's about making a conscious decision to do that. Okay, I'll be coming up uh, to you uh, later because we have some overlapping uh, themes and topics here yes. uh, between the coaching side and also uh, within the HR role. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I'll be just to check if Elena hears me. I do, yes. Great. Uh, Elena, I would like to move on now to the HR role as we discussed in the beginning because uh, it is a function that is um, working with uh, all other functions, so it's, it, it is a, a cross-functional aspect of it. Uh, we would like to discuss more about the HR role within the organization in terms of uh, preventive techniques uh, and also actually let's start with the general picture and, and then uh, maybe we discuss some specifics. Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I really want to thank to Velina for the insights she shared. I was actually taking notes as well and reflecting on um, and relating that to what we did um, in our organization past year. But as you said, to start from a more general context, uh, maybe just a couple of words for the people in the audience that um, um, maybe have heard or didn't heard so much about the company. Uh, Robert Bosch LD in Bulgaria started opera operations a long time ago, actually 27 years ago. Uh, and um, has uh, ever since had a quite successful and sustainable um, presence on the market with actually a team um, that is there for already, uh, most of the team is was there for 27 years. Mm, and uh, most of the business actually uh, is concentrated, um, has been um, in the sales area, uh, in things like, uh, power tools, automotive aftermarket, and thermal uh, solutions. And um, it has been like that since um, until actually 2019, when uh, Bosch Engineering Center Sofia um, started operations as part of Robert Bosch. Um, Bosch Engineering Center Sofia now um, actually uh, accounts um, as high as uh, 350 uh, colleagues, uh, quite big growth uh, for just two years and um, is focused as a research and development center focused on development of technology for uh, the automotive industry, mostly focused in automated autonomous driving, uh, electric mobility. So um, basically having really one goal to uh, build a future uh, for a safer and uh, more exciting mobility. So having this in mind, um, and speaking of 2020, uh, as Velina also said, I realized uh, last week it's it was already a year. And uh, last year at that time, as an organization, um, the organization was already one year uh, existing. Um, getting traction and with a very clear um, vision of how the business would develop, what are our priorities. But, oh dear, uh, little did we know. Um, what happened is that um, 
actually from the very beginning and early on, um, we as an organization took a very conservative approach um, and uh, uh, already in February, we started introducing measures uh, that were related to remote work uh, and home office. Um, it was quite challenging because of the specificity uh, of work actually of our colleagues, because um, it's not only software that we do, uh, but all the solutions that our colleagues work on um, have a hardware component. So they really need to be there hands-on uh, on the hardware in order to do their job. What we had to do um, is actually uh, that we had to reorganize the whole process in such a way that people have access and can continue doing their job because while the, the crisis was happening, um, actually demand from client, business um, and growth was continuing at the same pace, even higher later on. So um, the reorganization we were able to do um, in just two days and uh, we were able to focus and continue on the same pace. And actually, here is the first thing that I could relate to, um, to what Veli was saying, because in the beginning, um, we could really see um, a determination and motivation of people in coping uh, with the new setup and really feeling that uh, confidence in that they could still deliver same um, quality, same pace of um, solutions of work in this a little bit unusual, not a little bit, but quite unusual um, working environment than our normal setup. So throughout the year, um, it really didn't um, go on the downturn for us, on the opposite, actually. Um, the work demand and the projects kept rising. New projects came to the location in the, in the example of the engineering center. The organizational growth continued at full speed. Um, we were um, a 50% um, uh, more actually in terms of uh, colleagues at the end of the year. So we never faced a, a slower pace that could allow us to pause um, from the work, so to say, uh, work demand. And uh, at the end of the year, net net, um, the organization uh, finished with results and productivity levels that were um, higher actually than the previous year. So looking at that phenomena um, in the organization, uh, we could easily see uh, why it was happening. And um, the main reason for that was that people that work at our organization are really passionate about what they do. And Again, back to what Veli was saying, when you're passionate about your work, um, it's so hard to consider it work, right? It's so hard to put boundaries and you want to do more, you want to deliver, you want to um, prove yourself. Um, it was very interesting for us um, how this whole change um, impacted our culture. Um, speaking of values and culture, the organization also has its own culture. And we at, at, at ECS, for example, and at Bosch, uh, we really um, share the values of a family. And throughout the year, we were really going through different stages and um, the impact uh, even when we were deciding on different um, approaches and strategies, making decisions, we were always considering that strong aspect of how it's going to impact our culture. Um, 
the company has a very strong family culture and people um, are really truly and genuinely enjoying spending time with each other at the office so on a normal day uh you would always see people in the couch in the kitchen for example um exchanging uh exchanging different thoughts um then it's so usual for our colleagues to even stay after hours just to enjoy let's say a drink or a talk with each other and um that work um that people relate to more so as a mission um it's uh, really caused that they stayed dedicated uh and that they really were consumed uh, by their work especially having more time because we did a couple of, of uh, pulse checks throughout the organization and everybody was sharing of course i see the benefit of working from home because I save time, but actually what this time was translating to was more work uh, on their site in most of the cases. So um, actually, well-being, well, well being, uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, I, I want mm -hmm. I would like to um, uh, just to go to the specific question of, uh, because we discussed it earlier, uh, what do you view the line manager's role in uh, terms of assessment and preventing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is what I was going to say that uh, actually the well-being uh, was early on on our agenda because mm. uh, we started seeing um, um, beha different behaviors and everybody took it at a personal level, everybody um, took it um, in a different way. Um, so we had some behaviors early on in the beginning and um, we, some, we, we saw some, some people, uh, let's say that um, um, changed different behaviors or started sharing with us um, throughout the year and later on. But behaviors really varied from a very obvious ones that we would, um, let's say, associate with the uh, burnout or some um, disbalance in the well-being of the employee from panic to anxiety to fear. Um, while on the other hand, we had, uh, of course, people um, with more subtle, that were more subtle, not so vocal. And um, what we saw is that um, um, we had to take a couple of uh, steps uh, in order to make sure that we stayed at the eye level because working remote was really hard to feel that. I mean, when we stand side by side, um, we can easily see a change uh, in, in, in people's, um, in our colleagues, uh, let's say, how they are feeling uh, from one day to the other. In the, in the remote setup, it was really hard. So we focused on several pillars um, that we kept on systematically throughout the year. The first one was really to provide um, information um, to the employees and managers. Uh, we started early on with information sessions, uh, first of all, focused on the, providing a scientific point of view uh, on the environment so that we bring up a little bit more clarity, transparency, and sometimes psychological ease. Um, in the people. Uh, the second thing uh, we did was um, starting to organize self-awareness um, sessions uh, where we really talk to the people um, how they can easily spot on behaviors that might be caused by stress depending on their personality type but where that are not immediately related you know to uh, to stress, or one cannot easily or directly relate it to stress. Um, we also had to, speaking of line managers, um, we also uh, made sure that um, we um, worked with them closely um, and exchanged uh, signals, ideas of how people felt and what people need 
at different points of times. And if you ask me what was the role of the uh, land managers, uh, the short answer is um, central and critical because uh, they were the people that uh, know um, know the each team member and our line managers really stayed close and at the eye level with them and they always made time and it was our priority um, that they always made time to talk to the employees personally and in some teams we had 80 90 people it was never the case that the managers were not available were not there um, so when we took on this journey, not knowing how the year would turn out, we were clear on one thing, and that was that really people come first. They come before productivity and before work. And the first and most important thing um, that we have to do as an organization is to care genuinely uh, for the people as we would care uh, for a family. Thank you. Um, and just as a last question, because we already touched on that, but if you can summarize from the experience you had, uh, let's say two or three best practices um, that HR can use uh, with preventive measures. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I have to repeat value in this, but um, if we would have this all-purpose formula um, that would that I can provide, um, that would make um, our job so much easier. It's not. Um, we can we continue to um, be very flexible uh, because this situation is continuing. Um, we continue to be very flexible and. Uh, we have, um, as we said, everybody is living through this um, in their own personal way. That's such a personal thing. Um, and in, uh, in our organization, we see um, each colleague, each team member as a color of his or her own. That's why we try to whenever something happens we really try to be open and understand what would be the thing that would work for for the person yet uh, at an organizational level we try to be very systematic and consistent in the steps that we take and decisions we make as an organization so what we did for example um, in the past year was that um, we really tried to put this speaking of boundaries and sometimes the shutdown uh, at the end of the year we really could feel that um, people had enough uh, it was a tough year it was the most successful uh, and challenging year for us yet i think everybody was tired because we had to deal with an ever-changing uh, front both on the workplace and in our personal lives so to put that boundary um, what we decided to do is to actually give at an organizational level extra uh, vacation days for the employees so that everybody really has the time to shut down and not feel anxious that work is piling up while they are gone and this was actually recognized as a very good um, and needed uh, gesture uh, from the organization uh, by the employees um, uh, another thing that we did was constantly finding ways to show appreciation and finding ways to support employees to spend to socialize and spend um, um, have time for social recovery although we could we could not do it together um, so we really paid extra care uh, for example for um, providing uh, gift bags for Christmas um, that uh, were tailored to the employees, but also provided some vouchers for social experiences where they could choose to experience 
anything uh, with a friend, relative, or whomever, simply because we could not, as a team, be together. And the last but not least, even in the complex situation um, last year, uh, people really came up to us and said that they needed to spend time with each other. They needed to spend time with their teams. So in the fall, um, actually, we as an organization decided that despite the situation, we really will do a physical team building, <laughs> enabling people to be together. And the effect on this, of course, it was very precisely organized and uh, we had to be very strict uh, in, in order to make sure that uh, we, we keep people safe because this was the most important thing. But the effect on the morale uh, of people was significant. And this showed us that one way or another, we have to stay close and listen to what people need and try really our best to to provide it in order to match with their level and and stay at that eye level and keep resilience and and um, sustained kind of operation as we want to do yeah uh, thank you Ali. Uh, I believe that is going to be beneficial for some of the colleagues uh, out there or even for the line managers to uh, reevaluate the importance of their role in terms of uh, prevention and also assessment. Uh, and now moving on uh, to Zivco and the financial cost. Uh, I know it's a bit uh, challenging to talk about the financial side of it, but it's still a re reality. Uh, we don't want to um, underestimate the, the role or the emotional consequences of the burnout, but still it has a, a financial and business uh, uh, aspect of it, and uh, it's best to be prepared rather to try to dismiss it uh, as something irrelevant or not important. So uh, the financial side, uh, how can we uh, approach it in a practical manner? or How can we think about the financial aspect of the burnout, both for the person, sorry, uh, but also for the organization. Uh, good, I'll, I'll start with a very general figure uh, that, uh, yeah, okay, maybe let's start with a very general fact that there are no consistent studies on how much burnout actually does cost to the global economy. Mm. So there are some estimations uh, which uh, uh, dated uh, two, three years back uh, lie at around uh, 300 billion US dollars a year. 300 billion? Yes. And uh, uh, almost one third of them uh, associate with the United States. States, uh, another uh, uh, one third associated with the European Union and uh, the other third associated with Asia. So mm. the, basically the big economic centers of the world. And uh, uh, having said that, and also having in mind that uh, macroeconomy wasn't uh, never my passion, I, I'll move to, to something a bit, yeah, I, I, I'll go to something a bit more practical. Uh, so basically having, having in mind that uh, uh, in our part of the world, uh, uh, the units are relatively small. So even being part of a big corporation, the teams that uh, at the end of the day do the work, uh, uh, and that, that's also true for Europe. So we are, we are not that, uh, uh, not that uh, big, uh, big uh, teams, uh, but uh, basically even in a team of 100 people, uh, which uh, can be reasonably considered for a big one for Bulgaria, uh, having a burnout rate of, uh, let's say, 10% is a considerable burden. Uh, because, uh, uh, so again, what statistics shows is that uh, usually to onboard a new employee, uh, so the recruitment process uh, takes, uh, let's say, around three months, depending mm -hmm. on the industry, could be a little bit less, a little bit more. Uh, it's associated with a significant cost, depending on, uh, actually independent of if you work with an uh, internal, age, uh, internal uh, recruiter or in, in external agency. And uh, after that uh, three months of recruitment, you have uh, at least six months of uh, 
uh, incorporating uh, the new team member into the team, uh, really acquiring the organizational culture mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, uh, bringing him up to speed. So this makes uh, around two thirds of a year uh, of lost time for the organization, lost, lost pace. Uh, that uh, that is usually associated uh, uh, with direct cost, uh, but but also with uh, uh, missed opportunities. Mm. Uh, and uh, another another very important thing that's usually not assessed on macroeconomic level uh, is uh, that uh, basically a lot of uh, people who do who did suffer, suffer burnout. Uh, usually uh, change uh, drastically what they do after that, after that, after their recovery. Mm -hmm. And having in mind uh, that uh, burnout uh, uh, is mostly prevalent in uh, industries where uh, there is a heavy investment in education, like uh, information technology, uh, like uh, medical stuff. Uh, like life sciences, and it's also this also correlates with uh, with what Veli, Veli said uh, said prior, uh, because those are those are industry. Let's say for a medical doctor, uh, you need to to uh, do a quite long heavy work for six years uh, in order just to be allowed to be a practitioner. Mm. So just to, to start to learn really in the practice. And uh, so this, this could be quite exhausting. And on a, on a societal level, this is a, this is a quite a quite big cost if uh, let's say a person at uh, his early thirties uh, just uh, who, who just started uh, uh, realizing his potential or her potential, uh, who just uh, started to bring value to the society. Uh, for, uh, yeah decides to after after a severe burnout decides uh, that uh, he or she could do something uh, entirely not connected with the initial education mm. yeah or initial training actually mm. uh, the, oh yeah that is really the 300 billions i'm still <laughs> blown away uh, by that well and, and, and as, I, as i said uh, this is this is measured as only direct uh, cost for mm. uh, for the organizations and for treatment of the burnout. Mm. So the uh, the associated cost that comes along mm. for the society is not included in that figure. Definitely, definitely. This purely financial. We we're not just talking. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, because we talked a lot about the um, IT industry uh, thus far in terms of challenges, in terms of uh, ways to, to cope. Are there any industry related, because your experience is um, uh, heavy, heavily in life science, uh, are there any industry related uh, challenges or risk factors in, within the life science industry? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I, I did mention the relatively long span of, uh, of education uh, that uh, that uh, is required for a professional uh, even to start working. Uh, so basically, for a, a student uh, who, who is aiming at becoming a medical doctor, uh, the uh, only somehow related related to the study realization during his study after the I think third year is to be. Uh, uh, at the lowest level in a hospital and basically cleaning. Mm. So this is uh, this is uh, how how it's designed. It's it on purpose. There there is a reason why it is so. Uh, but this doesn't make uh, the uh, psychological burden on the on the individual uh, lesser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, then uh, again, uh, so uh, if 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 you go to the if you go to the if you step in the boots of the clinicians. Uh, basically, after a 12-hour 12-hour uh, workday, uh, you have a patient that urgently needs uh, 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 help, medical help. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very tough decision to cut off and to say, "Okay, I'm mm -hmm. done. Uh, I, I can do more." The shutdown techniques does not work. <laughs> no, no it, it works, but uh, but it, it goes along with uh, with another type of stress. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, don't get me wrong, I, I have I have been blessed to work with uh, with medical doctors who have performed. Uh, uh, I think uh, they they went up to nine open heart uh, open open heart operations per day. Uh, so just, just nine per day. Nine per day. Yes. 
uh, just, just imagine the level of stress uh, that uh, those teams uh, need to uh, because uh, yeah, uh, uh, open heart transport, uh, open heart operation basically means that you're putting the patient dead. Mm -hmm. So you're stopping his heart, putting it on a machine that uh, that does the work of the heart, and uh, yeah, then basically reviving it. <laughs> Uh, so, so if you if you are uh, uh, let's say uh, some uh, somehow uh, uh, not uh, psychologically prepared for that type of, of life, uh, you you could very easily suffer a very severe psychological condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, going to, going to the other main uh, going to the other main way of uh, utilizing. Uh, uh, why science professionals is basically research work, mm -hmm. uh, either being in universities or uh, being in the, uh, in the field of uh, pharmaceutical, other medical uh, development, uh, product development. Uh, so this is again a very long game. So uh, you could uh, you could reasonably work for uh, ten years, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, end up with having no result or a negative result. Mm -hmm. and that's a way different <laughs> type of challenge. Uh, okay, it's, uh, and I just want to uh, add something here tied to what uh, Veli said earlier about the, the professional identity. Uh, because having worked with uh, a lot of um, university students uh, undergoing medical uh, in medical universities or life science uh, degree, uh, especially doctors, um, uh, it, it, I've seen that it's a type of um, uh, family tradition or family profession transferred, let's say, from the father to the son or the daughter, and uh, this puts a, a lot of. Um, uh, sometimes subconscious, sometimes uh, <laughs> conscious and direct pressure mm -hmm. for performing, for becoming uh, the, the doctor or uh, try to compete with uh, the father. And, and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily um, the, the passion of the, of the kid mm -hmm. who, who wants to develop in that area. And also it's quite challenging area to develop in the first place mm -hmm. because uh, uh, going in a medical university is really taxing and it, uh, the type of challenges mm -hmm. are quite... Uh, uh, quite significant. So this is another area of, uh, in another la another layer of um, uh, maybe impacting the risk factors of, of burnout in, in, in life science. Uh, but enough about the <laughs> risk factors. What is the, let's uh, turn the question right now. We talk about the financial cost. What are the financial benefits of uh, prevention? Uh, yeah, ob obviously uh, every uh, every person uh, saved from burnout, so prevented to have severe burnout, is, success, is a success, and uh, it's a, uh, the person is a, is a success on a, on a human level first. Mm. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the benefits uh, the benefits are clear. So usually, uh, in order to uh, based on my experience, in order to introduce. Uh, uh, burnout prevention program in, on, in an organization, uh, depending on the scale, it will cost you uh, somewhere between uh, 5 and 10 percent from the real cost associated to treat a burnout or to replace a, a, a burnout. Mm -hmm. hmm. Great. Uh, so it is 5 to 10 percent. Yes. Wow. Yeah, because uh, you know, usually, uh, the, uh, if if we take a uh, hypothetical burnout rate of around ten percent from uh, from a team of uh, hundred mm. uh, over several years, in order to implement uh, tangible measures uh, to keep uh, those persons in line and basically uh, prevented, uh, yeah, you don't need to, that heavy actions actually. Yeah. And also, just to add on uh, about the cost and also the, the benefit from investing in prevention, uh, when you try to, because uh, this is more or less my area of expertise, when you try to replace an employee who has suffered burnout or was, is unavailable, uh, let's say for six months or eight months, depending on the recovery uh, time needed, uh, it also costs uh, uh, management time, uh, it costs recruitment time, it costs uh, the team time in order to, um, Get restructured or to uh, get used to a new employee. So, uh, and, 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 this, and this is from the scale of a bigger organization. So, if, yeah. if, if, if we talk about an uh, average uh, 
small company in Bulgaria oh. of around uh, 10 to 20 people. Uh, basically, uh, and yeah, the, heavy, uh, the heaviest workers are usually also the uh, bearers of the, of the know-how. Uh, and uh, so if you if you lose a person like that from the team, you could reasonably lose the business itself. Mm -hmm. Because on, on those type of organizations, it, it's not like the, the bigger one, it's not easy replaceable. They don't have, uh, let's say, uh, programs in place yes. uh, for uh, succession and so forth. So it's quite difficult to, yeah. it, it can uh, be a significant challenge for the business, if not to, <laughs> if not, yeah, so if it's, if it's in a, in an earlier stage, uh, it, it usually means sending the project. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I, I just want to ask Valia another question because this is overlapping overlapping team here uh, about how can an employee who has gone through a, a burnout episode, let's say, or a, a condition, um, what is the maybe practical ways for the organization to support his uh, recovery and returning to, to work if he wants to continue the, in the same uh, company and area? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and I, I did have three cases like this pretty mm -hmm. recently. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I uh, I got in touch with the person, with the patient at the time where they were already in a sabbatical mm -hmm. as a result of that. So, unfortunately, those those three cases, it was a bit um, too late. So, we were on the recovery, on the recovery path. Um, but the way that the company supported them, it was um, it was really nice because um, they were the ones sometimes that reached out. So in three, in two out of the three cases, it was actually the managers, uh, the manager who reached out to me to suggest uh, ways of how we can support that individual. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there are various schemes that are at place in the company that can support people to take, uh, let's say, creative or sabbatical leave for three up to six months, which is usually the I would say the minimum that you need in order to be able to heal yourself 100%, feel better and uh, get a sense of who you really are and get rid of all the physical symptoms that we just uh, mentioned. So um, if we find ways to really support people in that period that they feel certain that their job is going to be there once they come back, in all of those three cases that I mentioned, there was this inner uh, tension that, okay, I'm taking a break now, but at some point I need to come back. And there was uh, this pressure that maybe they're going to lose, miss out on something. They, they would fall, fall behind and uh, and they feel that this is really going to compromise their, their role and their impact in the company. So uh, what worked really well in one of the cases was the manager was in touch with that person once a month, just as an informal catch up, just to make sure things are going well you know, updating on the project. Just checking in on the human level was very uh, helpful for that person. Um, sometimes uh, we can actually invite people to work together in groups, which is also very helpful, and the company supporting those group activities, which is also very nice. Um, and I think uh, major, uh, the role that the organization can play is really the story that it tells the rest of the teams. Uh, and the people inside. Why is this person on the leave? What happened? Whose fault it is? Because a lot of the time people ask actually whose fault it was, why it happened, is gonna happen to me? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, da, 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 da. So managing the organizational narrative and the personal narrative of that individual, I think this is where the organization really has to be careful. Mm -hmm. And in all those three cases, uh, they did a beautiful job. Um, so they really synced in all uh, communication with that individual because uh, it's their health, it's their personal life, it's a lot at stake. So it was, it was really well managed. So I would say support if uh, the companies have uh, the opportunity to give sabbatical and all that so they don't lose the talent. Mm -hmm. As Jifko said, uh, if you have a chance to give your people three months or six months to recover, I'm um, not sure from a financial perspective, but definitely uh, that's on a human level, that's the, the right thing to do, I would say, given a second chance for sure. And then also managing this narrative, the organizational and the human. Yeah, actually, Georgi, if you, if you just allow me on a, on a, on a personal level, the, uh, what really uh, touched, uh, there, is a, there is a very, uh, there is a vicious cycle that, uh, that usually goes on with burnout and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's usually, okay, I'm working a job that uh, I don't know why I do, I work it, I, 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 don't, I, I don't like it, I don't mm -hmm. want to go there anymore. So there might be many reasons for those type of thoughts, uh, but on the other hand, I need the money. 
Uh, and uh, okay, now I, I, I don't feel exactly productive, uh, so I rather wouldn't change my job right mm. now, so I don't feel like. Uh, but I, again, I need the money, so this vicious cycle that uh, that uh, if uh, catched early enough in, uh, in an organization uh, could be uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, could could save a lot of a lot of resources and also a lot mm. of personal pain. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it works both ways on the individual level and the company level. It does make sense to uh, to invest in prevention, and also it's not just something. Um, <laughs> I don't want to put it uh, this way, but let's say it, it's not. We're not looking at it only from therapeutical standpoint. It does make sense for the business as well to invest, uh, because after all, it's from people to people, mm -hmm. and um, it, it it does make sense to take care of its more uh, most valuable uh, capital, actually, which is the human one. Uh, so now moving on. Thank you uh, both for uh, for this one. Just moving on to Lino. Uh, do you hear me, Lino? Hey, can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Yes. Whoa, uh, so amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, Lino will cover up uh, more or less the, the challenges of the startups and are mm -hmm. there uh, specific ones in different stages and also different coping strategies. But let's start with, let's start with something more general. Uh, the, the challenges actually of startups uh, and from your experience. Yes. Okay, Gary. And first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is a topic that's become very close to my heart because partially of my personal experience with going through a burnout and uh, kind of having to deal with it while I was running a company. And it's become one of the areas where I feel I, 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 I have a calling to contribute to any improvements to other people's life where, where I can because I, I feel it's such an important topic. Um, particularly with startups, I, I think uh, in order to explain why this problem is quite prevalent there, you need to understand what's really the job of an entrepreneur, right? And if we, if we look at the, um, you know, the dictionary definition, Generally, an entrepreneur is considered somebody who mobilizes people, capital, resources, and forms of leverage in pursuit of creating some new type of value and assumes personal responsibility for it, right? So it's a person that mobilizes, assumes responsibility, and generally seeks the creation of new type of economic value. If that makes sense, how do we do that, right? I mean, and it's... Um, Skipping through a lot of the detail of it, I think one of the most powerful tools you do, you kind of achieve that result is through your own personal identity. And I, I really want to echo what Valino has been talking about at the beginning of the talk, because I think it's super important and kind of how you view your identity and how you work with it is, is kind of one of the most powerful tools on one side, but on the other side is one of the most uh, kind of fundamental sources of why entrepreneurs tend to have a lower life expectancy and tend to suffer from mental health uh, or mental fitness, mental fitness challenges a lot more than the general population. I think some old data that I, I kind of uncovered from some old research I was doing some years ago suggested that over half of them in Silicon Valley, and this was done in Silicon Valley, but I would expect that these numbers would carry through in other geographies as well. Um, about half of people report or are diagnosed with some kind of, um, I don't want to say, oh, say mental illness, but they're somewhere on the spectrum. And um, yeah, and then there's, uh, I can quote a few other figures in a bit, but there's quite a few starting ones. And getting back to how do we work with our identity as entrepreneurs, I, I, you, you, to be successful, you generally require some kind of a perfect storm between extreme humility and extreme hubris. Should, should I maybe what hubris means? Because I'm not sure the entire audience is English speaking or? Uh, yeah, so, so humility, I presume everybody knows what it is, right? It's like modesty, you you doubt yourself, you have this strong critical thinking, you you doubt everything, you, you look at the world a little bit like a scientist, you you have this uh, market hypothesis uh, that you formulate uh, how you can create value to that market, and then you scrutinize every bit of your thinking about it until you prove it to be fairly accurate. But, but on the other side of the spectrum, you also need, uh, uh, I, there's a truck going for some, Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, and yeah, that's a hubris. 
I think the, the simplest way to explain what hubris is, is they submit, uh, I, I, I believe it's actually a historical fact, uh, when uh, Emperor Xerxes decided to invade Greece, they, they run a number of campaigns, right? And they had these massive armies and uh, the Persian Empire was in, invading uh, Greece. And uh, well, one of the things that happened was that um, they tried to breed, build this bridge through some kind of um, area of water or something like that, and, um, and like a lagoon uh, uh, on, on, the, on the coast. And there was a massive storm that destroyed the bridge, the wooden bridge, pontoon bridge they were building. So he ordered 300 uh, soldiers from his army to get whips and whip the ocean for 20 hours to punish the ocean for breaking and destroying the bridge. And then they went and built the bridge again and went for it. So, so this is kind of hubris. You, you have this insane sense of uh, self-confidence and belief that you can control the world, right? And, and having these two states of mind in, at the same time that, that, are, sorry, that are quite conflicting, it, it's almost a little bit schizophrenic and it's, it is quite difficult to exist in that uh, state of mind. But this is exactly what's necessary in order for you to be effective as an entrepreneur because your job is to kind of move reality in a slightly different direction um, and, and kind of make the world what it ought to be in, in certain very, very narrow, specific context. And you usually are very effective in doing that if you embody the story of, and, uh, and the new form of reality before it actually happened. It has happened for other people. So, so this, this puts you in a really, really difficult position where you need to, as I said, be very critical and self-critical of everything, but also demonstrate this incredible level of confidence. So, so I think that is the most uh, useful answer that I found from my thinking about why entrepreneurs are so susceptible to, to these uh, mental health challenges. Uh, thank you, that, especially the hubris part. Uh, how many uh, whips of the ocean was there? I guess it was 300 people doing it continuously for like some very long period of time, like 20 hours, something like that. We can check what the Greek, I'm sure Greek historians documented this in some, some story or something like that. But yeah, that was yeah, great. Uh, yeah. Uh, and also from your experience, uh, are there any um, specific points of higher risk uh, of uh, burnout in different development stages of a company? Yeah, you know, I, you, you asked me this question, I thought quite a bit about it, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure they are. I mean, I, I can list a few places where you typically kind of experience higher pressure, but I think part mm -hmm. of the what was really hard about this is that it's like, again, Valina said, it's, it's not that there are these really strong spikes of stress. They are, there are loads of them. But that's not what generally gets you, or at least that's what didn't get me. I mean, I, I, I'm I, really good at the crisis. You throw me in a crisis, I can, like, like there was this saying, every idiot can deal with the crisis, but almost nobody can deal with day-to-day uh, -day life, right? And, and the, the problem with it is it's quite chronic. It's, it's, there's constantly something going on. There's constantly a bunch of fires. And, and it's just, it wears you down over time. And, and you need to have really, really good strategies in how you manage that. Uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise, you, you potentially can get in some trouble. Again, great quote <laughs> with the crisis and the idiot. Uh, but yeah. um, from your experience, because I would like to move on now to the coping strategies, what uh, did help you uh, with your episode and what have you learned from it? So I've learned a lot, and I don't think this uh, talk can, uh, the way we can go through it. But uh, when I'm talking about that episode, I, I, I kind of, I think I'm still learning from it because it, it happened in 2015, and I still don't think I've recovered from it. I, I it just, I, I feel I need to, and I've done a number of kind of organized campaigns to work on on my state. So, so it's maybe who I've become, like I've become a different person after that, but. Uh, I kind of have still this hope that I would recover to my previous state of energy and, uh, you know, resilience to stress and so on. But uh, I, I, that through that time, I've uh, learned a lot about myself and learned a lot about what works for other people as well. And I, I think the strategies you need to take into account fit in several broader categories. And um, and I think uh, one, one we, we spoke about is how do you work with your identity? And it's really, really important that you, even though working with your identity is a useful tool for running your company, you should avoid completely making your identity equal to the identity of the company, the success of the business. Because when you do that, inevitably, 
stuff happens with the company and the business and their problems and things look like they're going to fail and in a very scary way and we always kind of have this catastrophic view of failure of our failure that's beyond what probably is actually happening in, in reality and how other people think it and that that becomes really really difficult on your on yourself personally and that actually hurts the company even more so, so it's really important to have another identity and another Kind of place where you retire where you have hobbies family relationships friends and, and just things where the the failure of the business doesn't really affect that part of your life and those parts of why you're successful as a person regardless of the failure of the business which is always uh kind of every startup i know is facing imminent failure at least once a year and that they get through it uh time sometimes and sometimes they fail right uh, so, so I think that's one really important area that's probably we, we probably can't get in the full depth of it and this uh, conversation for people to appreciate it. But just if if the audience can keep it in the back of their head and just reflect on that when they get more experience, if you don't have that experience and you don't know exactly what I mean already, how, how does this uh, actually manifest? Another one is just uh, building your own resilience. And, and yeah, just that there isn't a really easy way to go through creating companies and running startups uh without you actually getting it some tough times I, I believe at least maybe, maybe i'm not as uh, intelligent or skillful about it uh, but I, I think that's the experience i've seen reported by other people uh, yeah so so we were we were talking about building resilience and uh, muscles tend to grow after you make them work and simulated but during times of rest so so part of your uh kind of ability to, to build resilience requires you to, to take a step back from time to time and, uh, and kind of lean back and rest. And, and that uh, builds your mental resilience when you iterate through periods of high intensity stress and then you, you get times of relaxation. Unfortunately, while you're running the company, that might feel from uh, your mental resilience point of view as one big iteration until the whole thing stops because it's just, as we said, it's chronic. So, so you must kind of uh, find ways to to help yourself for that and some techniques that help uh, are things like journaling meditation uh just uh different self-reflection exercises there's a whole domain of how how we can work on those challenges and maybe i'm not the most qualified person in the room to talk about that so I, i'm quite open to let somebody else comment on it but I, i've been trying to pick up a number of these uh techniques myself of uh, you know setting some form of goals and comparing myself to them because normally i realize that i always overachieve those goals that they set but by the time the results come after a lot of work they, they have shifted in my head and i'll expect a lot more from the company and myself and it always feels like you're not doing achieving anything but in fact you're moving quite a bit so so, so there's uh, there's a number of things like that and and then i would uh, kind of move to to the next uh, general domain at least in the way i've organized them in my head which is the physical health aspect of it and, and uh, just uh, making a comment the time where i made a lot of progress in this area in my life uh happened after i started treating uh, my mental fitness state mood as all well, not just as uh, some shortcoming that i'm having or i'm just in a bad mood and i should get over it and stuff like that but just as a genuine physical health uh, situation and this happened after reading and understanding this a lot uh, after reading about this understanding it somewhat that it just it's a kind of a biochemical situation in your brain which again i'm probably not the most competent person to explain this uh, very well but at least for me, the moment I could appreciate it as uh, this is the same thing as I, I've just run for 20 miles and I'm really tired and my body needs to recover from what I just did or, or I just uh, have a cold and I have a fever so it's normal that I can't perform as normal and you accept that this doesn't contradict your beliefs about your identity as whatever it is you're a leader strong person you should be responsible and so on on some level and build a model where this doesn't crash in your head then you can actually internalize a lot of these behavior changes that you need to do and actually solve those problems, right? And that's often not easy to do and you need to get educated on those topics. Uh, but, but then uh, talking about other aspects of the physical health, I mean, exercise makes a huge difference. And, and it took me a while to figure it out, To although it's, it's kind of feels like a truism that everybody knows that and we should all be doing it, but just uh, to internalize that to a level where I feel stressed at work and I need to, to deal with something and then I'm able to say no and let some offend somebody, hurt the relationship, let the fire burn, let the company lose a bunch of money and, and I still go and go for a run or something like that. In the long run, that really pays off. But learning that behavior was incredibly difficult and it's something, I mean, you should do. 
uh, I guess that's what I can say at the moment. The other one that was really hard for me was sleep because I refused to appreciate that uh, sleep was as important as everybody else was telling me because I thought, you know, work hard, play hard is a really cool thing. And I, I'm just uh, somehow I had this strong belief that my physical body is somehow better than the average person. So I can just work with four hours of sleep and I have this really intense life and uh, kind of at some point in my 30s that stopped working the way it did in my 20s. And I'm to in some extent grateful for that because it forced me to to consider this in a different way. And I adopted a number of techniques and strategies about improving my sleep, which which helps. And I, I have still quite a few challenges around that. And I, I actually really blocked a little bit about sleep uh, recently. So if anybody's interested, you can just ping me on social media and actually important in my experience. Uh, and uh, Elon Musk recently spoke about this because he's somewhat famous as a workaholic that runs several massive companies and just claims to work uh, hundreds of hours a week, hundred something hours a week. And he basically said that he experimented quite heavily with reducing his sleep. And he realized that uh, there's a sweet spot of about six and a half hours of sleep, which science would tell you is less than what the human body needs. But I don't know, maybe, maybe he's just some superhuman or maybe an outlier, maybe just he's uh, exaggerating a bit, which I think is more likely. But he, he figured that after you get done the six and a half hours of regular consistent sleep uh, per night, you the company started failing and... Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, the company started failing, but his work deteriorated dra dramatically. And he even cried on TV a couple of years ago talking about this, which, which is quite an interesting experience. I encourage you to listen to that interview if you're having challenges in that space and you, and you haven't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think the human body needs about seven to nine hours of uh, high quality sleep. And uh, it just it pays off in your work as well, despite just being the right thing to do. And the third one, I think, uh, related to physical health is nutrition which again is a really broad topic, but uh, just uh, taking care of your nutrition and almost building around these whole areas of mental health, of physical health, a whole stack of tools and techniques and measurements. And they don't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to sound technical, but just take it as, um, I, I don't know, you know you have to change the oil of your car and take it to the mechanic and you get insurance for your car and you clean it and you do a bunch of stuff and you see when your car is kind of in a poor shape and most of us, Tend to know how to take care of a uh, tool like this and a device, and we don't apply taking care of our body in the same way. I think if you develop a mindset like that and you just um, turn it into some kind of methodology that applies to you, it, it it helps over time. So so that those are I think the broad categories, and I'm happy to dig into any of them if if you have thoughts or just maybe some of the other people in the room can connect with these topics and and contribute. Thank you so much. First of all, you know, for all the entrepreneurs in the house. <laughs> Uh, exercise, sleep, and good nutrition, and also challenges are to be expected <laughs> in the entrepreneurial area. Uh, so moving on now uh, on uh, uh, that basis to Ivo, uh, Ivo, I believe uh, you are, uh, as you mentioned, the burnout triumphant. <laughs> Make sure to no. catch our uh, interview with Ivo in our burnout triumphant series, series which will be upcoming um, uh, soon, uh, but no, uh, right now, um, uh, from your experience, I would like to, uh, because this is the, the final chapter of our journey tonight, uh, what are the main, uh, let's say, lessons on, or uh, the main things that you've learned through, through your experience? Mm. First of all, I really want to make our conversation a bit emotional, mm. because we are staying so much on the science point of view, finance and stuff like that. But we are talking about really, really important and really personal experience. So I will start with what Lino said about, uh, about let's say, okay, let's tell you, let me tell you a story, a personal one. Uh, but first of all, let's put our auditory in context. Mm. So if you are driver, if you're driving your car, you're given a dashboard, and this dashboard shows you indicators. If the temperature of the, of the motor are getting high, there were, uh, let's say, lights or red zone, something like that. We have RPMs, we have uh, zones of speed limits, and stuff like that. And we are, let's say, focusing on these indicators and taking actions on 
on if the temperature of the motor is high, we would stop, do something, go to the mechanic or something like that, like Lino said. Mm. But every day we are driving our physical body, a really important or high important than the car, <laughs> but uh, we are driving our psychology um, vehicle, our, uh, let's say, our mind, our um, abilities to make decisions, as we discussed, ability to, to be um, emotional um, creatures and stuff like that. But we are not taking care of any kind of indicators. We don't have any kind of dashboard. And when I tell you my story, please, please, uh, listen kind of indicators I personally ignore. Because in every day, we ignoring a lot of these symptoms, these indicators, mm -hmm. and thinking that this is, uh, this is life. But this is not life. Let me tell you a story. I am, um, I, I am, oh, I am really high in ambition. I am high flyer. I have a lot of uh, different personal and professional goals. I am a um, guy with total belief in uh, his ability, but also I am a guy that thinks my career is me. If I fail in my career, I'm failing as a person. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is uh, truly important because Veli really said it's from time to time it's about purpose, about meaning. Because a lot of us, a lot of people like in my generation, but it's not only in my generation, are starting thinking that if they fail in their career, they're failing in their lives. But this is totally not true. But I am a guy that thinks like that. I'm not sure why, but I'm, I'm like that. So I have a really good career in corporate life. I'm climbing the career ladder with temple that few of uh, the, I'm really proud of that stamp, of course. Uh, I used to work on the, in the retail. I started at the lowest level and after that built my career. I became, a, a, let's say, manager of the store. After that, a regional manager. After their zone manager, start uh, my responsibility to, let's say, half of Bulgaria, a lot of different stores, a lot of uh, manager of majors. So I'm really proud of myself. And I, after that, I'm becoming, uh, let's say, a big director, sales manager of the whole retail chains. A lot of people are on my commands, but also I became a board member. So uh, hmm, uh, the owner of the company said, okay, if you uh, succeed on this, the, your package will have these benefits, a lot of money, new car, a lot of different things that, as Jivko said, we are let's say, starting to, to not uh, having ability to work without them. Because company car is something that it's really nice to have. Um, and um, I'm really ambitious and I'm starting working on my limits, but I'm not, I'm not knowing my limits. So I'm working really hard. Um, let's say in my worst, worst days, I'm uh, working, Leon said, 100 hours per week. My personal record is 140 hours per week. <laughs> so uh, our auditory maybe know that in one week there is 168 <laughs> hours. So uh, Lino said, well, sleep. How um, sleep I have in this week. <laughs> and other my personal record, six months straight without any free day. Six straight months. Um, and they're starting uh, indicators. As you said, really, first apathy. Mm -hmm. I start to be really apathetic about things that used to have, let's say, creating emotion in me. I'm start to be apathetic about football and my loved club. Um, even I, I'm not. I'm so apathetic that I know that there is a match day, a really important match day derby. But I said, okay, but this is not the person that I used to be. I was really passionate about mm. football, really passionate about uh, friends, about a beer after hours, stuff like that. Like that. But I start to be apathetic about it. Uh, and so what? We have a big derby, Liverpool, 
Manchester United, I'm a big Liverpool fan, and so what? So what? After that, I start losing my sleep. Um, but as Lino said, this is a great opportunity to work. <laughs> okay, you're up around three o'clock in the morning. Oh, great, I'll send a few mails. Uh, and after that, I back, bark about it, how I'm good and sending emails at three o'clock in the morning. And I'm uh, telling my managers, look at me. I'm so good example of uh, what you have to do. <laughs> and creating a stress for them, of course, but I'm not, uh, I'm not knowing about all these um, consequences. After that, I um, start changing of my temper. I did I start my, let's say, about my daily. I, I use, I'm very calm people in better days, but when the stress and the burnout starts, to getting the most of me, I start losing my temper a lot. Mm. And be from uh, screaming to my managers and uh, blaming them for no reasons to, let's say, feel sorry about my behavior, uh, uh, feeling depressed or uh, that I'm not good. I don't have to, to deal with uh, the situation like that and stuff like that. So I am from here to here. Mm in 15 minutes. But this is again something normal. But I start feeling that everybody uh, is acting and starts to feel that uh, she right now is not looking at me in good situation. She's, uh, let's say, thinking that I'm not good of what I do and start feeling that uh, everybody is acting like enemy. Mm -hmm. Like um, all of my managers are, uh, let's say, in some kind of plot mm -hmm. to, and this is a situation in every day. So I'm thinking usually as my HR is uh, creating something uh, mm -hmm. behind my back sabotaging and you. sabotaging and mm -hmm. trying to stab me on my back. And I start treating you as my illusions. Mm -hmm. But and this is creating a lot of problems. And you said that there is a, a big financial uh, loss. But if what I am, I'm uh, one of the top decision makers in the company who are treating everybody badly, mm -hmm. not in your sense on the decision making process, what these costs are and how we can measure them. So I'm a top decision maker with uh, big budgets and I'm not acting the same. Mm. So I'm not sure. But after that, I'm start losing my weight. I'm, I'm, you said that maybe different organisms react differently to mm -hmm. burnout because I saw few people that gaining weight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about stress and burnout syndromes, but I'm start losing weight. But I'm always a bit thin guy. So I'm not, let's say, uh, noticing that I'm losing my weight. Uh, right now, I'm not uh, a fat guy, but I'm uh, around uh, one meter and eighty and eighty kilograms. But in my worst days of my burnout, I my 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 weight was uh, fifty kilograms. <laughs> I'm I, I'm not sure that you can imagine uh, what I was look like. Uh, I don't have uh, and yeah, but even then, I will not stop in. Uh, I, let me bring you back to the indicators and the dashboards. How many things I, let's say, ignore? And um, what is the catharsis? Mm. Um, I'm, right now I'm wearing the glasses. Uh, and um, I have, um, right now in my uh, right, ear, uh, right eye, I have a minus four uh, uh, diopters. But uh, I start, Right in this situation, I have around minus two or something mm. like that. But um, the glasses that I wear at that moment start not working for me. I, mm. I cannot see. I go to the ophthalmology and it's, it's interesting because my sight on the right ear was uh, from eight, uh, 1.8 to around 4, 4.2. And then I said, <laughs> I, maybe because there is a lot of years be, be, uh, before I, ma I made the glasses and the situation. Maybe I 
not noticing. And uh, we make new glasses with correct neuropters and uh, continue to work like, like, like I, I used to work. But uh, around two months later, the new glasses are not working again. And I totally blamed the ophthalmology because, uh, of course, <laughs> it's not me. It's not me, of course. Uh, but when you, I go there and they again measure my sight, it's uh, a big shock. The right, the right eye was minus 10. Minus 10. So we're talking about physio, physio, uh, psychological apathy, hectic behavior, something like that. But there is a physical, physical part of burnout. So please, please look closely to your dashboard and don't ignore it. Great. Um, if was, uh, congratulations on your new book. Uh, first of all, and the new uh, whole stretch system. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, he was going to give the details, but um, I mentioned that because um, in his uh, latest um, book and the concept behind the system is actually this uh, balance of different uh, roles that we have and also how to integrate the personal and the business uh, or professional lives that we have um, uh, with one another. So, uh, Ivo, can we touch touch a bit uh, on that? Uh, what is your recommendation of integrating these uh, different roles that we had? Um, first of all, uh, something very important. Um, burnout is a serious situation, as we discussed previously. And as Veli said, uh, we have, uh, let's say, uh, levels of burnout. Uh, so, if you are in the burnout, you don't need coach, you don't need books, you need expert. Uh, this is something very important. And I think books, people like me, are only on the privation part of the, uh, the process, not when uh, things are really bad. Uh, but uh, uh, what is my system? I totally believe that we, as Lino said, we as the persons, we as the companies that we build, we are anti-fragile, as Nassim Taleb said. Um, we have ability uh, to, when you encounter, let's say, stressors, to build resources to manage these stressors. So I'm, I'm, I'm let's say, a very simplistic way of thinking. What is stress who is causing uh, burnout? The stress is when the stressors, stressor is higher than our resource to cope it. Mm. So first of all, if you are, let's say, having something like the situation that you don't have the resources, first think about the resources. Can you build the resources to manage the stress? Because Lino, as uh, and everybody here, as uh, let's say, as uh, people with a lot of experience, we, saw, we see our, let's say, young, younger uh, colleagues in the office and see how they're stressed about one meeting with the client. And you said, oh, <laughs> oh, God, don't cry on me. Uh, this is something that's so usual. usual. Uh, I'll show you how to do it. But you have the resources. But he not have your resources yet. But we can build resources. This is something that uh, I think is really important. But from time to time, even on chronic stress, as we said, you cannot build uh, resources because as our colleague said, uh, so different stressors, how mm -hmm. to build resources and they are changing like COVID, like uh, uh, every day. So uh, our, uh, our stressors are totally changing. So it's maybe it's not the best uh, uh, strategy to focus only on the resources. So is it other possibility? So I totally think so. As we said, and Liu said, and maybe value well, can confirm it, it's a biochemical reaction on the stress. Uh, our brain put a lot of stress hormones, mm -hmm. like cortisol, neopenephrine, like testosterone, uh, adrenaline, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So this is a stress hormones. Uh, but there, as, uh, as Leo said before me, uh, they're exhausting our body. Mm. We're running 20 miles and 
this is what this adrenaline cortisol make physical and mentally for us. So if you cannot stop running, because as we said, we have to pay for the bread, for everything. So if you cannot, is it possible to put uh, happiness hormones in our systems? And Lino touched the point, can we uh, see other domains of our life who are making us happy, like um, family and uh, romance relationship? So we are start focusing on the romance, uh, romance in our, uh, let's say, in our marriage or our romantic relationships. This could, as we all know, could create a lot of endorphins, a lot of serotonin, a lot of... Uh, so if we, as Lino proposed, start uh, working on our physical health, mm -hmm. like uh, going on fitness or running, because I'm a big fan of running, we can add a dopamine or something like that. If we focus on the family, are really taking care of our parents or our, in our child, we can add oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we can use these hormones like antidotes. And this is all about my stretch system. Please remember when we were a child and we are dry, uh, riding our bicycles, when we are looking at this direction, the bicycle start turning turn to the direction that we are focusing. And we, as the professionals, are looking only on our careers and wondering why our life is turning only to our careers. Mm. So let's start looking at different directions. Five domains or eight domains, uh, as uh, Lino said. My stretch system uh, will say, okay, the career is one domain of our life. Okay. Finance are other parts of our, our life, but what about romance? What about physical and mental health and fitness? What about friends and society? What about our uh, family, our parents, our close ones, our child? Mm -hmm. What about fun, mm -hmm. hobbies? So if you look at, I, this is a common and very um, known tool, uh, it's called Wheel of Life. So download it, just wrote on the Google Wheel of Life. Download it and let's say use the Wheel of Life to assess your life. And you can easily see why burnout came to our life. Because we have, let's say, 10 points on the career, like my situation, but zero points on fun, zero points, points of health and fitness, zero points on romance, zero points of family and how not to burn out. Mm. You cannot ride with that wheel, you cannot move forward, it's going to skip. Mm. Or it's really be bumpy ride. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ivo. Um, where do uh, people can find more about your stretch system? www.stretch.bg Great. Uh, and make sure you tune yeah. in <laughs> for the in-depth interview with Ivo on the Triumphant series, series. Thank you so much for the uh, participants uh, uh, offline and online as well. Moving on now to the Q&A section, you uh, still have time for everybody who is uh, watching us uh, live to type in your question uh, for us. Uh, so I'll start with the ones who are, were already um, asked. Let's see. Oh, uh, I believe we touched on this already, but uh, we're going to uh, change them into common themes uh, because we're limited on time and we want to be respectful, respectful of everybody's time. So uh, maybe let's point out some of the, I believe it, 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 this will be most appropriate for you to answer. What are the physical symptoms of burnout? The, the physical the physicals, symptoms, the first yeah. signs. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is actually a quick test you can do. I mean, I'm glad that um, we mentioned the uh, topic of stress hormones because we all know about it, we read it, but how can we see it on our bodies? And we all know from popular um, psychology and uh, just general knowledge that actually stress shows on our skin very, very easily, mm. very quickly. So a lot of skin issues are actually associated with unmanaged uh, stress uh, levels and also chronic uh, levels of cortisol and adrenaline in our body. So one very easy uh, test or self-assessment you can do is if you try to sc uh, scratch your skin, I'll try to do it, but <laughs> not sure if people are going to see it. Um, so if you do like a very, uh, like a tiny gentle scratch, not, you know, hurting yourself, you see there is a white line on your skin and then it's going to become red. Um, this is very much related to our skin's uh, ability to regenerate. We know the stress hormones actually, they deteriorate our immune system, our capacity to grow muscles, to recover and everything. Mm. And this is shown on the skin very quickly. So if you look at this red line, it needs to, it may be becoming red now, white is red. So if this red line goes away in around uh, five minutes, it means you're kind of fine. Maybe you don't have high uh, levels of uh, stress hormones in your body at the moment or accumulated over time. If the line stays red between five and 10 minutes, it means that most probably the stress hormones in your body are in the mid to higher levels and you, you need to take care of yourself. And this, mm. this is actually very obvious obvious on your skin if the line stays more than 15 minutes um, it can be a sign that you have chronic stress and uh, completely i would say um, take care of yourself yeah. as everyone is appealing uh, go speak to somebody reach out check what what else is going on in your body because we don't hear those symptoms but when we see the line it's very obvious um, Going back to generally what we can see, of course, our skin shows uh, a, a lot and gives us a lot of signs, but also, um, as I said, a lot of gut problems are a sign mm -hmm. of chronic stress. All kinds of uh, unexplained, uh, unexplainable headaches, um, muscle pains, chest pain. We also had this feeling of, oh, you know, I feel this kind of, you know, uh, this big uh, swamp in my throat mm. or I feel chest pain. This is usually something that we shouldn't feel on a daily basis. Um, also physically, sometimes we have lowest energy. If we start having lowest energy in the morning, that's an issue. That means that there is a disbalance in our uh, stress hormones mm. because usually in the morning we should feel most energetic. If we feel tired in the morning, that's definitely a physical sign that we're not okay. Um, also, some uh, some people experience change in their skin color. We are becoming pale, we are losing weight, or we are gaining weight. It really depends in which direction you're going to go. Uh, so observing all of that is very important, guys. Just make sure you watch the barometer. <laughs> yeah, great, thank you. And I'll for sure be monitoring my... Yeah. Uh, my <laughs> um, uh, do we dive into questions? Mm -hmm. uh, ah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the next one, it's a kind of a general one, but uh, maybe we uh, we can all answer together or, or add into that discussion. Uh, do you have any tips how to distinguish a team member being in a kind of burnout phase from general type of uh, disengagement at work, not caused by being overloaded? Is it for me again? Maybe, maybe HR. Maybe, maybe HR. Yeah. <laughs> then we can add it. Okay. Yes. So, uh, as Ivo said, it's a very personal thing. And um, we can observe mm. behaviors uh, that really range uh, from uh, becoming obsessive, uh, becoming more... Um, direct or rude even sometimes uh, to um, really lowering um, and uh, um, not willing to uh, share anything or kind of even seeing more of a shrinking and low-key uh, the person uh, than usually he is or she is. Uh, the key uh, here is um, observing those changes and to to us um, the key indicate the the key indicator uh, would actually be um, seeing uh, uh, the person behaving differently extremely differently than he or she would do on a normal day or we're used to seeing him 
him or her. Uh, that would be, um, I think, um, really the alert. That's why we talked about how important it is to stay close uh, and observe this. Um, because it, it's different. It's different for, for everybody. So spotting the really uncommon patterns of behavior uh, can be really be useful. And uh, as Ivo mentioned, uh, his uh, temper uh, swings or <laughs> mood changes uh, are really one of the clear indicators. Uh, and also, in order to um, assess the more um, adequate, adequately, we should consider the context of the situation. So, for example, if this uh, type of behavior or changes continue throughout, let's say, a month or two, because I don't believe, Ivo, in your case, you did not express them only for a week. No. <laughs> so it was a continuous process. So if, it, if the um, significant inadequacies in behavior are uh, observed to uh, throughout time, uh, maybe that's a clear sign at least to uh, have a conversation with the with the employee uh, in order to discuss it. And also uh, to keep in mind, maybe Veli will uh, like to, to comment here, but we do have to keep in mind, especially from the line manager's perspective and HR's perspective, uh, that this is a sensitive topic. Uh, we cannot expect uh, that everyone that everyone will be comfortable talking about it and direct about it. So we do need to be considerate about the well-being and um, also the, the delicacy of the of the topic. So we need to approach it uh, appropriately. Mm -hmm. I, I can add something here. I can actually share it as a resource afterwards uh, with one of my partner companies. We work together with Camp Light and they're developing a tool that can help to make this emotional check-in at the beginning of, of team meetings or one-on-ones that can really help to open the dialogue mm -hmm. about how are you feeling because I know it's a sensitive topic. So it's actually a digital tool that can work very well in the remote working environment. So I think we can add that. It's called Team uh, Moodlight and it's uh, free for now. So we can add it maybe in the resources. Yeah. And it's a great way to actually check in with everybody, uh, see if there anyone in a red line or in a blue and then start the conversation because it's a good way to you know open up the topic mm. and uh, create empathy in the room instantly so I'm thinking uh, what's about the burnout guys not uh, uh, part of the team as uh, maybe he's a founder is mm. a high-level manager with a lot of power and he's not like in my situation, not admitting that he's in yeah, uh, he's going to have the conversation with you. Yeah. <laughs> the executive well, coach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, could be. Uh, look, actually, on, on my end, uh, what I have noticed actually uh, exactly in, uh, in people in, in your situation, from yeah. top positions of, of yeah. founders, it, it's usually they're starting to, to show fear from things that previously excited them. Like uh, I have, uh, I have to meet a bunch of bunch of investors, and yeah, you know, this is usually exciting. You are going to pitch uh, your idea. You are going to, uh, you you are, you are going to get some feedback, and uh, when you start to show fear there, and uh, yeah, you feel like uh, I prefer not to. Uh, this uh, for me is a very clear sign that uh, that there is something going on, and you really need to step back and and do some internal check. -out. Uh, check out here. Yeah. Oh, we are already six minutes overdue. Mm -hmm. uh, great. So, yeah, we, we do have a, 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 a few other questions that are um, mostly we've answered them throughout throughout the discussion. Uh, we also have a question about the hormones. Uh, what are the stress hormones uh, and uh, the, as you mentioned, the happy hormones mm -hmm. as well. But I believe we mentioned that uh, already. Uh, I don't want to turn this into a biochemical discussion, especially <laughs> because I know a <laughs> few people in the audience uh, with expertise in, uh, in that area and they will be really careful. <laughs> Uh, so we, we don't uh, want to upset anybody, but let's say in a, in a general classification uh, uh, in terms of stressful ones, if we can label them uh, that way. Uh, also, one other thing, they are not bad hormones. 
uh, mm -hmm. there isn't about good or bad. They are vital uh, in from evolutionary and from uh, biochemical standpoint to the uh, proper functioning of the body. Uh, the problem is with uh, extensive production of <laughs> those type of hormones. But uh, Ivo, I believe because you mentioned them and also the, the two of you mentioned them, um, can we please repeat the stressful ones as we decided to label them that way and the happy ones? So, please, yeah. if you want cortisol, mm -hmm. neoprenephrine, I'm not sure because I'm uh, not a competent guy on this, but neoprenephrine really affects our sleep mm -hmm. and it's part of, uh, of amygdala creating this uh, stay, stay awake. There is uh, very dangerous things mm -hmm. and this is very important to know. Our amygdala, our Let's say it's old, uh, old brain doesn't make a difference between physical threat and uh, the threat of our ego. Mm -hmm. So if our, as I said, if my career and my position in my company is in the situation of uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, threat or something like that, my amygdala see it as a tiger. <laughs> so, <laughs> and act like a tiger, so creating this cortisol, not uh, neoprenephrine, adrenaline, testosterone, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I'm I'm not sure. Everybody, cortisol, neoprenephrine, testosterone, adrenaline, and neoprenephrine. Yeah. Yeah, and how about the good ones uh, or, or the, the ones who counter that? Uh, also, one uh, other thing to touch because this is my area of expertise, but I don't want to uh, overtook the, the discussion. Uh, but also the uh, the antidote of that because uh, you cannot be in the those hormones actually create a, let's say biochemical, physical, and emotional state. Uh, and you cannot be um, at the, uh, simultaneously two different uh, types of, sta of states, especially uh, the polar ones. For example, you cannot be stressed out and grateful at the same time. You mm -hmm. cannot be courageous and fearful at the same time. It's, it's not possible because it's a different type of uh, hormonal mixture <laughs> or cocktail that's going, uh, and, um, going in from the same receptors. Uh, so on the antidote side of it, uh, what are the good hormones, let's say? how we can counteract the, the effect of, uh, of the stressful ones? Uh, in my opinion, oxytocin, the hormone mm. of uh, human touch, yeah. of mm. caring. Yeah. After that, serotonin, mm. the hormone of team play, enjoying Liverpool winning. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe endorphin also, for those the goals, uh, the, the winnings, the, the, the ability to, let's say, uh, uh, of course, to, to win something, to, to get a prize or something like that, it's creating a, a both serotonin and endorphin reaction. Mm -hmm. Of course, endorphin and at my, let's say, but it's dangerous hormone again, it's dopamine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why if I stop running, because uh, running or all endurance sports give a lot of dopamine, but if I stop running because of the weather, well, start happy. feeling... Um, <laughs> bad and uh, dopamine depression because uh, <laughs> <laughs> as we said not the good hormones are not only good mm. because maybe your our audience know that uh, gambling as a habit is uh, dopamine related, related. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, i believe simon Sinek had a really nice classification of the f uh, four major good ones uh, dopamine yeah. serotonin endorphin and Oxytocin, oxytocin, yes. Um, and uh, in, in his book, uh, Eaters Eat, Leaders Eat Last. Uh, so I encourage everyone, everyone to look at, at this. Maybe we can share it in the resources, but it's really nice and really practical look at the hormones without all the biochemical stuff, uh, <laughs> only expressed through uh, our behavior and how it uh, relates. Okay, do you want to add? Uh, yeah. Ah, I absolutely agree with that. I know now in a time of pandemic where we need to keep the distance, social distance mm. in a way, it's a bit challenging, but there is a great study that shows that actually 20 second hug a day, every day, it decreases uh, your stress levels over time and, you know, your birth pressure impulse, your birth pressure and everything. So generally, uh, if we have loved ones around, just make sure you spend that 20 seconds a day, <laughs> at least, which is the bare minimum, I would say, yeah. physical connection that we need. Yeah, and also not to confuse, uh, because I, I've heard someone talking in an interview uh, lately, not to confuse the um, physical distance with social yes, distance. Mm. Yes, mm. yes, yes. 
Great. Uh, so uh, let's wrap on that. Uh, we already 12, 12 minutes, as if we would <laughs> point out 12 minutes overdue. Uh, thank you all for uh, being our guest tonight and to discussing um, for discussing this topic. And thank you for the uh, online our online guests as well. Guests as well. Um, as we mentioned, we, we hope that it, it was beneficial to everybody watching uh, it, because some of the questions were um, that uh, whether or not it should be a replay of this, uh, yes, it's going to be. Uh, so make sure you, you catch that as well if you want to um, view it again. So thanks for everyone watching. Uh, thank you for being uh, with us tonight uh, and uh, stay tuned for our, our next talk of the series. Uh, we're gonna be posting uh, the resources we've mentioned. Uh, yeah, good. <laughs> we're going to be posting the resources we've mentioned. Uh, you, you can uh, also within our description there is information for every one of the speakers, uh, so you can check them as, as well and uh, in their different identities, professional <laughs> professional identities. So thanks again. Uh, it was my both my pleasure and honor to host this event for you. Uh, and thanks for the team in the studio who was behind the cameras. Woo! Thank you guys for. <laughs> Uh, for providing the, the platform for us uh, to have this conversation. Thanks again and bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. bye.